service here this evening at the Tron Church. If you're visiting with us, you're very particularly welcome. Uh, you'll see that our table is spread here at the close of the service. We gather around the Lord's table. Uh, and all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity of heart are welcome to join us with him uh, at this table. The psalmist says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And as we come before the Lord often, if we are honest, if we are regarding him and looking at our own hearts, we do feel like that, don't we? Crushed. But his mercy gives us hope. His mercy gives us light. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who takes our sin away, our guilt away. And we can come to him, therefore, gladly and joyfully. And our first song this evening is on the screens, and it reminds us of that. As we come before him to pray, we do feel our sins would make him turn away, but not so because of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we sit, let's pray together. (laughs) 
And we come, Lord, to you with such joy and such peace in our hearts, knowing you, the God who so loved the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And our hearts, O oh God, grasp hold of that wonderful promise, that wonderful revelation that comes to us as the light of heaven above into this dark world, into our dark hearts, into hearts that when they are touched by your truth and by your righteousness and therefore challenged and cut deeply right to their core by what your light exposes of our lives, yet at the same time receiving in that same word that exposes us, a word that touches us and cleanses us and washes us and makes us new and plants your seed of life within us that we should be changed forever by your word of power, born again by your living word of truth and brought back from our waywardness and our lostness and our foolishness in the darkness of our sins into the light and the warmth and the beauty of your great love. And we will never tire, Lord, of, of singing this great song of your grace and mercy. Never tire of rehearsing to our minds and to our needy hearts the truth of your gospel and singing with gladness to one another singing together, singing back to you, echoing back from earth to heaven the wonder of your love for us. And so, Lord, as we come tonight to hear your word afresh into our ears, to see the visible gospel word that this table proclaims to us, to take into our own hands, even into our bodies, the truth of the gospel in, in such a tangible, near and real way, we pray that once again we would know the transforming wonder of that word within us. And so being strengthened and heartened and encouraged and challenged and taught and rebuked and instructed and filled with joy that we would go on our way the better to serve you, the more nearly to walk with you, the more gladly to love you and to proclaim you all the days of this coming week. So draw near to us, Lord, we ask. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of your own risen, glorified Son, our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. If you, were, uh, if you were with us this morning, you'll have uh, picked up one of the notice sheets. Uh, if not, they're out on the, uh, on, on the uh, shelves there. Do pick one up afterwards. There's a, an update there from our mission partners, the Murray family. Uh, it was lovely to have Scott with us this past week, and uh, many of you heard him speaking to us at the prayer meeting. Uh, do pick one up, though. There's, there's detailed notes there as we think of them, particularly this month in our prayers. There's also various notices about the life of the church this coming week. Just to remind you that being the first Wednesday of the month, uh, although we met last Wednesday to pray, uh, we meet this Wednesday again to pray uh, together. Then uh, next Wednesday, the second Wednesday, we'll be back to small groups. So do come and join us as we pray for the Murrays, but all our other mission partners and many, many others uh, on Wednesday evening together. Well, we're going to uh, turn to our Bibles. Terry McCutcheon is preaching to us this evening, and we're uh, looking together at the Psalms, at Psalm number 130, page uh, 518, if you have one of the church Bibles there. A short psalm, but a very profound one. 
deed. That's the very word, profound, depths. It is from the depths, de profundis, that the psalmist speaks this prayer. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, we're going to sing it now in uh, a version that's in our blue books here at number 130. From the depths of shame and sorrow, from my guilt and from my despair, Lord, I cry to you for mercy. Be attentive to my prayer. Number 130. for the Lord's work are received now and as the musicians play quietly you might like to be just in prayer for those you know to be in particular need or perhaps to be uh, reading this psalm that we're going to study uh, together as we do that our offerings are received
Let's pray. The music says to us, Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the weight of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. Through every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Your gracious heavenly friend through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. What a wonderful comfort, Lord, it is to us to be reminded consistently by the words of Scripture, by the words of our Christian praise, that you are a God who is with us, that you are Emmanuel, the God who has not stayed at a distance, but drawn near, near even to lost and rebellious, sinful hearts to bring us back, to make us your own. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that we can therefore have such great confidence in the power of your grace to plumb the depths not only of our own sin and sorrow, but that of those that we love, those that we care for, those whom we pray for. And sometimes we wonder if their hearts, their lives are impenetrable to your gospel. Whether our prayers are pointless and fruitless. Whether their situation is too intractable even for the God of heaven. Not so. Not so. So, Lord, as we come to your word tonight and as you speak to us, would you fill our hearts with fresh confidence in your goodness, in your grace, and in your great power to change the human heart and to form and to fashion that which is beautiful and that which brings glory to our Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity and for all to see and marvel at and wonder to the praise of your glorious grace. So open our hearts, Lord, we pray, and fill us afresh with your glorious truth, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Terry comes to uh, preach to us then, we're going to sing number 785 in the Blue Books. Again, a reminder that it's only by God's extraordinary grace that we can enter and stand in his presence. Number 785.
I invite you to take your Bible and to turn with me again to Psalm 130, which you will find in page 518 of the Pew Bible. And as you turn that page up, a brief prayer. Make the book live to us, O Lord. Show us thyself with, within thy word. Show us ourselves and show us our Savior. And make the book live to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. I wonder if you are familiar with the television show called Top of the Pops. Let me just explain what the show was about for those not familiar or those of a younger generation. Top of the Pops ran from 1964 until 2006 and was usually broadcast in BBC One on a Thursday evening. It was a television show that was dedicated to the music charts here in the United Kingdom. Each week the show would reveal to the watching population what the highest selling song had been that particular week. And remember, this was during the time before music was available to download on computers and iTunes. You had to physically leave your house and go to a music store or a, a record shop, as we called them. And you had to buy a, a single vinyl record or a single CD. So after purchase, purchasing their single record or CD, folks would be tuned in to Top of the Pops in the Thursday evening to find out what had been the most popular song amongst the nation that week. The charts would begin at number 40 and work their way down, sometimes revealing new entries to the charts. And remember playing the music as it counted down? Do, 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 do. And you in at number 29. Um, <laughs> then into the top 20. And then the illustrious top 10. 10, 9, 8, 7. The top 10 was revealed until we got to number 1, revealing what the song was that was top of the pops, revealing which song had captured the mood, the thoughts, the feelings, and the heart of the nation that particular week. Some songs had a very fleeting relationship with the nation. One week at number 1, and then the song disappeared into musical obscurity. Others managed to stay there for a few weeks, with the longest being there for 17 weeks. In different decades, amongst different generations, different genres, different types of song captured the mood, thoughts, feelings, and emotions of the nation's people, resonating with the heart of the nation. And friends, I share all of this, I hope, as a helpful way into this evening's sermon, as we come to the book of Psalms, and to the songbook, the hymn book of Israel, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. More than any other book of the Bible, the book of Psalms captured the cries from the heart of the people of God. And not just one generation of the people of God, but every generation of God's people. And not just during a particular part of life or a, a particular stage of life. These Psalms, these songs resonate with the believer all through life. As we turn to the pages of the Psalms, we find there is an honesty, a transparency, and a great dose of realism about the life of faith that we can all identify with and take great encouragement and great assurance from. And if we are really honest, the honesty, transparency, and realism that we find in the Psalms, we don't often find too much from each other, which is why I think the Psalms are so popular amongst God's people. My title this evening is Going Up While Crying From The Depths, which I've taken from the heading of the psalm and the first words in the psalm. If you look to the heading of the psalm, a song of ascents, which quite literally means a, a song of going up. Well, going up where, you might ask? Well, going up to Jerusalem. If you would look in your Bible, you would see that Psalms 120 to Psalm 134 all have this heading. These 15 Psalms are known as the Pilgrim Psalms, the Songs of the Pilgrims, the Ascent Psalms. For these Psalms were sung by the people of God as they were going up to Jerusalem. Going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the three great feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Atonement. So the psalmist was going up. But look to verse 1. Out of the depths I 
cry to you, O Lord. The psalmist is crying out from the depths. He is going up while crying from the depths. Well, friends, if we are here this evening and we are truly Christians, then just like the psalmist, we are the pilgrim people of God. We may not be on a physical journey to the city of Jerusalem, but we are on a spiritual journey to the heavenly Jerusalem. As the writer of Hebrews writes, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So this psalm has something to say to us, because just like the psalmist, we are a pilgrim people. And I am sure, friends, that this psalm resonates with all of our hearts today. I would like to take the psalm under three headings. Firstly, in verse 1 and 2, needing the mercy of God. Needing the mercy of God. In verses 3 to 6, knowing the mercy of God. Knowing the mercy of God. And then thirdly and finally, verse 7 and 8, sharing the mercy of God. Sharing the mercy of God. Well, firstly then, verse 1 and 2, needing the mercy of God. It is always good that when we come um, to the Psalms that we note the particular tone of the Psalm that we are reading. I think it's fair to say the Psalmist is not having a good week. It's certainly not his best day. The Psalmist is not rejoicing. He is despairing. As Psalm 130 opens, we do not find the Psalmist at the top of the pops. No, the picture that is given us here is a picture of a man drowning in the depths of the sea. And these verses are very similar to the opening verses of Psalm 69. Let me just read those for you. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. That's the picture we Exactly the picture we have here in these opening verses of Psalm 130. The psalmist is not rejoicing. He is despairing. He's in the depths of despair. He is crying out, I am drowning God. He is a man who has sunk to the bottom where there is no foothold. And he will surely die if he sinks any lower. These cries from the psalmist made me think of a song by the Beatles that reached number one in 1965. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know, I need someone. Help. John Lennon wrote that song in 1965 when he was 25. He died at the age of 40. And in an interview with the Rolling Stone magazine a couple of months before he died, he was asked about that song. And this is what Lennon said. Those words were not just the lyric. Those words were the cry of my heart. But no one came with an answer. And friends, this song by the Beatles is a song that we need to get crying out before God. Help. But truth be told, friends, it's not help. We often cry out before God. No, it's usually another song by the Beatles entitled, We Can Work It Out. And friends, I'm not just talking about people out there in the world. No, I'm talking about people in here, people in the church. Some of you ought to be crying out help, but instead you are crying out, I don't need any help. I've got this one covered. I can work it out. I mean, after all, God helps those who help themselves. Well, friends, let me just make this absolutely clear. You cannot work it out. And God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who cannot help themselves. And the psalmist knows he cannot help himself. So the psalmist is crying out from the depths, help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know, I need someone. Help. But look at who he's crying to. He is not crying out to family members or friends. He is not doing what the pop song of the 1990s suggested. You've got to search for the hero inside yourself. And searching for the hero inside yourself is often the view taken by modern day therapy and counseling that all the answers are within, they say. Now, don't misunderstand me, friends. I, I'm not knocking therapy and counseling. There's a lot in there that's good and should be celebrated. 
And that's the sort of work I'm involved in, supporting those with addictions. These things are okay in themselves. But if they are not governed by the cross and Scripture, then sometimes their outcomes can be absolutely disastrous. No, the psalmist is, is not looking to family members or friends or looking for answers within. He is not trying to work it out. He's in the depths, and he has a need and a hunger for God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. He needs God to hear him, and he needs God to take notice of him. There are many people in the depths of one situation or another, and it's only then that they ever begin to think about crying out to God. People are maybe crying out to God presently, maybe due to financial difficulties, or because they're locked up in a police station or a, or a prison cell, or maybe crying out to God from the depths of a sickbed. They need God. They are hungry for God to intervene. They want God to hear them, and they want God to take notice of them. But often what people want is this. What they want is a miracle. They want the financial position to be resolved. They want to be freed and to be let out of jail. Or they want to be healed from the sickness or the disease that has invaded their body. Now, friends, please do not misunderstand me. The Lord is concerned for these things. But it seems, according to Psalm 130, there are other concerns even more pressing than these things. So what does the psalmist want? Why is he crying out to God? Well, the psalmist wants mercy. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. My pleas for mercy. Now, friends, mercy is a real need. Because verse 3 tells us that the psalmist's real problem is his iniquity. It is his sin. He is drowning under the deluge of his sin before a righteous and a holy God. It's his sin that has got him in the depths. He is crying out from the depths of his sin. And friends, unless a man or a woman has cried out to God from the depths of their sin, then they have never cried out to God at all. He is drowning in the depths of his sin. It's his sin that is the real problem. And friends, that's the world's real problem. Not everyone might believe that, but name me a problem in the world or in your life that isn't caused by your sin or the sin of someone else. Behind the world's financial difficulties lies greed. Behind broken relationships, selfishness. Behind the crimes of those in prison cells. It's sin that's the problem. And even those lying in sick beds with diseases and illnesses, these are from the effects of sin in a world separate from God. Friends, we do not need a miracle for our situation. We need mercy for our sin. You and me and all the world are exactly like the psalmist, needing the mercy of God. Because just like the psalmist, our real problem is sin. Well, verse 1 and 2 the psalmist needs the mercy of God. But secondly, verses 3 to 6, knowing the mercy of God. Knowing the mercy of God. In verse 1 and 2, we have a picture of the psalmist drowning and unable to stand in the bottom and unable to swim to safety. But now as we come to verse 3 and 4, the psalmist has moved from the sea to the courtroom where again the psalmist cannot stand due to his guilt. But it is here he knows the mercy of God. And that is because knowing the mercy of God is, is knowing the real gospel. Look at verse 3. The psalmist knows that his real problem is sin, which leads to real judgment. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I once heard a story from the life of Arthur Conan Doyle, um, who created the character of Sherlock Holmes. And the story goes like this. Arthur Conan Doyle sent a telegram to 12 of the most respected men in London. The words on the telegram read as follows. Flee, all is revealed. That's all the telegram said. And the story goes that within 24 hours, six of those men, six of the most respected men in London, had made arrangements to leave the country. Flee, all is revealed. Now, friends, I wonder if just for a moment you would imagine 
there was a DVD of your life, of your full life, of all of your thoughts, all your words, everything you had done, and also everything you failed to do. I wonder what rating you would put in this film. If there was a film of my life, then there, there wouldn't be enough spaces on the cover for all the X's that it would need. You wouldn't find the, the film of my life in the family section, nor would you find it in the romance section. In fact, it would be found in the horror section. Would the film of your life be any different? Now, I am sure that just like me, there would be a load of scenes on that film that would be absolutely fine. Acts of great kindness, moments of great joy, maybe celebrating your marriage, the birth of your children or your grandchildren. But I am sure that just like me, there would be loads of scenes in that film that you would never want anyone to see. You would never want anyone even to know about. Now just imagine we've given a copy of the DVD of your life to those that are working on the sound desk. And just in one minute's time, they're going to play the thing. I wonder what your reaction would be that if scenes from your life were about to be revealed, then I am sure that your reaction would be like that of Arthur Conan Doyle's friends, that if all were to be revealed, you would flee right out of this church, right out of this city, and right out of this country. Now, why would that be? Well, isn't that because you know you could not stand under the, ju the, the, the judgment of the good people here in the Tron Church? Isn't that why you would flee? We know you could not, you know you could not stand under the judgment of folks here who incidentally have a DVD of their own lives that's just as bad or even worse than yours. Now, if we could not stand under the judgment of folks like that, then why do we think we could stand under the judgment of a holy and a righteous God? Friends, if God marked our iniquities, who could stand? Who could stand? Not the president, not the pope, not the prime minister, nor any of our policemen or any prisoners in our prisons, and certainly not a person in this building. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And friends, the psalmist knew this, and that is why the psalmist cries for mercy, because verse 3 is about the real justice of God. Real sin leads to real judgment. But that's the last thing the psalmist or any of us needs. Justice condemns the sinner. Justice is no use. I heard the story of a minister who was up at court for driving offences. He was speeding, doing 50 mile an hour in a 30 mile 30 mile per, per hour zone. It wasn't me, but it could have been me. And the judge ruled he would be banned from driving. He was going to lose his license. And made an impassioned plea to the judge. He said, please do not revoke my license. I need the car for visiting the sick and the dying. Please show mercy. And the judge just peered over his glasses and said, this court does not deal in mercy. This court deals in justice. Justice is the last thing the psalmist or any of us needs because justice condemns the sinner. Justice is no use. We need mercy. Real sin leads to real judgment. But the psalmist also knows that in the real gospel, there is real forgiveness. Verse 4, but with you, there is forgiveness. Friends, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that begin with a great but. But for me, this is the best one. So I'm going to read it again. But with you, there is forgiveness. Does that not bring great joy and relief to your heart this evening as it does to mine? Not that there might be forgiveness or there could be forgiveness or there maybe be forgiveness. No, but that there is forgiveness. And the psalmist also knows the source of this forgiveness. But with you, not with me. Thank God it's not with me. The source of this forgiveness is the Lord himself. God has done something, not with me, but with you. And I am sure as the psalmist walked about Jerusalem and the temple in particular, he saw God's provision for sinners, lambs being born and sold and sacrificed on the altar of God. And what the psalmist saw in the temple was a foreshadow and a pointer to that great provision that God had made for sinners in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. But with you there is forgiveness. Friends, maybe there's someone here this evening who has never experienced the forgiveness of God. Maybe you think the depths of your sin are too deep. Or maybe you think there is a, a particular sin that you have committed, either once or repeatedly, that cannot be forgiven. Well, friend, if that's you, I would ask you to look at the last verse in the psalm. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. There is no sin that you, me, or anyone else can commit that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot deal with and bring us forgiveness. No matter how bad the record of your sin might be. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul understood. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in the letter to the Colossians. Has happened to the record of our sins. Colossians 2 verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, that is Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The record of evidence against us has been cancelled in its entirety, totally forgiven. It has not been swept under the carpet, friends. Cancelling the record of our debt has come at a great cost. It has been set aside. It has been nailed in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross. He himself has redeemed us. Verse 8. But with you there is forgiveness. And the evidence of that forgiveness that you may be feared. This may seem like a, a strange outcome of forgiveness, but in reality it is not. Fear of the Lord is the, the beginning of wisdom. Those who have been forgiven will want to live wisely in the fear of the Lord, which is in being in awe of his character and his works, and also being obedient to his commands. The Lord Jesus Christ said, If you love me, you will obey my commands. But not only does the real gospel bring real forgiveness, the real gospel also brings real assurance. Verse 5 and 6. Charles Spurgeon said of these verses, the psalmist has come out of the depths of anguish to the heights of assurance. Well, where does this assurance come from? Well, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. His assurance comes from the, the Lord's word, Yahweh's word. The word of the promise-making, promise-keeping God. This is where his assurance comes from. Not from his own feelings, but in the facts of the word of God. Martin Luther, the, the great reformer, was asked, Do you feel forgiven? And Luther replied, No, but the word of God tells me that I am. And later would, uh, Luther would later write this poem, Feelings come and feelings go. And feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God. Nor else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned. For want of some sweet token. There is one greater than my heart. Whose word cannot be broken. I'll trust in God's unchanging word. Till soul and body sever. For though all things shall pass away. His word shall stand forever. Friends, we can't trust in feelings. They go up and they go down. But just like Luther, we can trust the facts of the word of our God, for they never change. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And again from Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. His assurance in the word of the Lord now produces in him confident waiting. Verse 6. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. Watchmen on the city walls would, would long for a new day to dawn. When the new day would dawn, they would rejoice, knowing that the city has been kept safe for another night. The psalmist is saying here, 
I am confidently waiting. The night may not be over yet, but the Lord will be faithful to his promises. I am in this for the long haul. The morning will come. The Lord will come and deliver fully and finally. The psalmist now assured of forgiveness and assured by the word of God knows that the coming of the Lord to redeem him is more reliable than the coming of the morning. Needing the mercy of God, knowing the mercy of God, and thirdly, verse 7 and 8, sharing the mercy of God. Verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption. There is a great contrast in tone between verse 1 and verse 7. The psalmist has gone from being a, a penitent prayer to a passionate preacher. When you need and you know God's mercy, you can't keep it to yourself. You've got to share it. In his first cry, the psalmist was only interested in himself and God. But now, now his interest extends to others. The psalmist is no longer sunk in his own situation. He has good news and he has got to share it. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with him there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is hesed, the covenant love of a faithful God. His love is steadfast, even to those who were rebellious. And with him is plentiful redemption. This is the God of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the God who was generous and abundant in creation. He is plentiful and generous in redemption. The generosity of God's love and redemption is far greater than all of our sins. But friends, I wonder if you notice two things about the psalmist's preaching. Firstly, he is preaching to us to put our hope only in the Lord. For only with the Lord is there forgiveness, verse 4. Only with the Lord is there steadfast love, verse 7. And only with the Lord is there plentiful redemption, verse 7. The second thing about his preaching is this. He is preaching only to Israel, verse 7. O Israel, hope in the Lord. And verse 8, he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Well, if this is only for Israel, who then is Israel? Does this mean that all of us here this evening have no hope of these things? If we are not Jewish, who then is Israel? Well, in the psalmist day, Israel were an ethnic people. But remember, foreigners or non-Israelites could force their way in. Remember Rahab the prostitute, Ruth the Moabite, or Naaman the Syrian? That's the way it always was. But what about today? Well, today there is no need to try to force your way in to the people of God. No. Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So who are Israel today? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So friends, there's a question for us to ask ourselves this evening. Do I belong to Christ? do I belong to the Tron Church or any other church for that matter? But do I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you do, there is forgiveness for you. If you do, there is unfailing steadfast love for you. If you do, there is full and plentiful redemption for you. Are you here this evening, friend, and you don't yet belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? Then can I urge you that before you leave this place this evening, that you would look and learn from the words and the experience of the psalmist and that you would cry to the Lord Jesus Christ about your sin. A cry is all that is needed, friend, but it is to the Lord Jesus Christ alone that you must cry. And what better opportunity than now as we come to communion and the Lord's table? The Lord Jesus Christ invite sinners to come as you eat the bread and suck the wine 
may you know and may you experience and taste that indeed with the Lord there is forgiveness. Let us pray together. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. We thank you for the indescribable gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, to close this evening, friends, we are going to sing number 729. In Psalm 130, the, the psalmist could not stand because he would drown. He could not stand in God's courtroom um, due to his guilt. But now he has forgiveness. And just like every Christian, the psalmist can now sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, this my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
And may indeed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Dearly beloved, it's right that we should remember that this sacrament that we celebrate together now, that it is a memorial of the great sacrifice of Christ for the sins of men. Now, a memorial in the Bible is never so much about us remembering as it is about God remembering. And it's very important when we come to this table here because we are calling God himself to remember his covenant. We're calling God, therefore, to be gracious and merciful according to his promise, his covenant, his unbreakable bond sealed in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're calling him to visit us in mercy and grace in answer to our prayer for mercy, that we should know that mercy as he's promised. So when Jesus tells his followers, do this as a remembrance, as a memorial of me, that this is uh, the new covenant in my blood. He's saying that because, as Paul says to the Corinthians, as, as we read at this time, in doing so, he says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is, until he comes and our justification, our vindication before God is claimed for all to see because we will have resurrected resurrection bodies, perfect bodies that show to the entire world that God has declared us just. But until that day, we know that only by faith. And this table proclaims that truth. And we proclaim it Yes, to ourselves, but much, much more importantly to God himself so that he will remember his covenant, so that he will show us the mercy he's promised. Think way, way back to the beginning of the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, when God said to Noah, when he put his rainbow in the, in the sky as a sign of his covenant, what did he say? When I see the rainbow, I will remember. Not you will remember, they would remember, but I will remember. I will remember my covenant not to destroy this earth, despite your sin. And the sin of man was not washed away, was it, by the flood? It was still there. And God said, likewise, through Moses to the people of Israel, when you paint the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels, and the destroying angel comes through the camp to visit his judgment upon every firstborn in the nation of Egypt. He said, I will see the blood. Now remember what I've said, I will pass by. And so, in just the same way, the Lord says to us, keep this memorial meal to proclaim to God the blood of the new covenant, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, to call him to remember that once for all sacrifice for our sins, a fact of history and a fact for our forgiveness. And so in taking this bread and this wine, we are saying to God, remember your promise to be merciful and just to forgive us our sins. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. We're proclaiming to God, it will not only be a dereliction of his promise of mercy, but it will be a dereliction of his justice not to forgive our sins because our sins have been paid for at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God's justice demands that he remember that great price. And that's why we come to this table not groveling for his mercy, but joyfully, gladly, reminding God of that which he has been delighted, pleased to give us and to promise us his everlasting mercy 
sealed for us in the body and blood of his own son on the cross in Calvary. So this is not a mere empty ceremony. It's certainly not just a remembrance for us, although of course it is that, and a powerful one. It's much, much more. It is a real covenant renewal. It is a real reminding of God, a real inviting of his intervention to once again assure our hearts of what is done, what is sealed, and what is therefore promised to us forever. We say to him, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until the day that he comes. We're proclaiming our faith in your promise. And so hear us and answer us. And may we respond with faith and obedience, trusting in your promise, laying hold of these gracious memorials that preach that gospel to us so powerfully. So this is a true means of grace for everyone who believes and trusts in him, for everyone who takes this bread and this wine and says, in doing these things, Lord, I am reminding you of what you have promised. So be good to your promise. Remember your covenant. This is a bond and pledge of our union with Christ, a bond and pledge of our union with one another in the grace that is in Christ. A great and a gracious assurance of that which is real and that which is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, of course, that's why the apostle tells us that it's important that we, we come to the Lord's table the right way. It's a great matter of eternal justice and eternal mercy that we're dealing with. And so we come with knowledge, with faith, with repentance, with love. Not holding fellowship with evil, not cherishing pride or any sort of self-righteousness, but conscious of our weakness, conscious that we cry from the depths, sorrowful for our sins, but humbly putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hungering, thirsting for him, and seeking the grace that he's promised. And all of us who come with that humble trust, with a love for our Lord and Savior. And you know your own heart. I can't see in your heart. We can't see into one another's hearts. But God can. God does. He knows our hearts. And if we come with that true and humble, penitent trust in our Savior, then we know that our Savior will never turn us away. It's he that invites us to come to him and to receive at his hand. So don't let anyone hinder you from coming if that is your heart. Most of all, don't let your own heart hinder you. Sometimes, as we sang at the beginning of the service, we feel, we feel our sins would turn us away, turn God away from us. But his word, his promise is our warrant, not our feelings. He used to say of the Lord Jesus, scornfully, hatefully, this man eats and drinks with sinners. Those are some of the wonderful, wonderful words in the scriptures, aren't they? Yes, he does, with people like you and me. And he does so tonight. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So hear then the gracious words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. The one who comes to me, I will by no means ever cast out. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be filled. And so the Apostle Paul says to us, I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as a memorial, a remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as the Lord took bread and wine, we take these simple things, these ordinary elements, but set them apart for this wonderful gospel work that they fulfill, proclaiming the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. And as the Lord gave thanks, so let us give thanks as we draw near to him in prayer. Let's pray. We do thank you, O God, our Father, for your wonderful promise, for the deliverance that reaches down into our depths and promises us your forgiveness. We thank you for the vivid word of this table that points us back to the cross, back to the place once and for all where the body of your son was broken and where his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. A past that is certain, accomplished and forever effective. We thank you that it, it also points us to the future, to the wonderful joy that awaits us, of the hope for which we wait. Our souls wait for the Lord, even more than watchmen for the morning. We wait for the great day when we will celebrate in joy in the kingdom of the Father. And with our Lord Jesus Christ, having received our justification, the bodies like his that will display to this whole world the might, the power, the wonder of your saving grace. But until that day, O oh Lord, we thank you also that this table reminds us that you are Emmanuel, the one who has come down to be with us, never to leave us or forsake us, but here, now, in us, in our hearts, by your Holy Spirit, bringing heaven to earth and drawing our hearts up to heaven itself, that we should know you day by day and hour by hour as a living Savior, a great high priest, one who is always with us to lead us in the way everlasting. And so, Lord, help us in eating and drinking by faith to apprehend the wonder of your covenant love and grace, to be assured deep in our hearts where we need such assurance of your everlasting forgiveness and to fill us with hope. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so according to the holy institution and the command and the example of our Lord Jesus, we now do this. Who on the same night when he was betrayed took bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as a memorial of me. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as the servers come and serve you now, if you would take the bread and eat as you're served, 
take the cups of wine and hold them until all of us have been served together. And then I'll indicate for us to drink together as one, in one communion, one fellowship of the Lord's people here. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <coughs> Let's drink together. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray a moment. Lord, it's moving as we hear the Farsi singing from downstairs, a reminder of the wonderful, <coughs> boundless fellowship of your gospel, which is for all peoples and all nations, all tribes, all tongues. And how we do long for the day when, unhindered by the barriers, of language or geography or anything else. We shall be praising your name together with all of your people from all time, from all over the world, forever and ever. What a sweet reminder even now of the communion <coughs> that is unbreakable and unshakable between you and all your precious people. So, Lord, we pray, part us with your peace, with your blessing, and with your strengthening of our hearts to live for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing ourselves as we close this evening, number 900 in our blue books. Number 900, to him whose power is able to protect our stumbling feet and prepare our souls for glory. Let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. <laughs>